never done something you said you never do. You know, we all sit there and look at someone else and they're having a discussion. They say, oh, I'd never do that. Well, that wouldn't be me. For those of you who are parents, remember watching other people raise their kids. Oh, when I'm a parent, I'm not going to do that. It was a sad Friday night. And I'm sitting all alone at home, and I said to myself, oh, and I did something I said I'd never do. I answered a personal ad. And I married a man nine months later. <laughs> so what happens when you step outside yourself? Now, a personal ad, you already know that that gives you a bit of a fun and idea. That's 26 years ago <laughs> when we didn't the <laughs> media. <laughs> didn't have match and all these other things. But for me, I was never going to have answer a personal that. And boy, it turned out to be one of those marriages that everybody dreams of. Oh, I don't mean that, you know, that, that we did have times when we irritated each other, you know how that goes. But after I was years of marriage, I just called them billionisms after a while. It's just bill, beating bill. Mm -hmm. And you learn in a good marriage that you don't really change the other person that much. It's a community to come together and move towards each other in different ways. Twelve years into a marriage, suddenly my husband who's doing kickboxing and yoga, power yoga sessions, he was years of age, suddenly was becoming short breath. He couldn't get what's wrong and he went through all different things. And finally he went in for, uh, for experimental surgery and there was this is me, a virus. And like many people in this room know, you go in naively thinking, it's going to be one way. And the surgeon told me, standing in Fairfax Hospital in the middle of the, of the room, well, your husband has terminal cancer. There's no treatment for it. It's mesothelioma, which comes from asbestos. He may live for two more months. And suddenly, I'm going, why? Isn't that something we've all said? I don't care whether you're a widow or widower. All of us said, what now about life? We all have experienced, haven't we, the unwanted, the unknown, the unexpected. You know that, those kind of days where something major happens. It could be finances that we had going for us. It could be a job. It could be our health, or big, that relationship. And it's not just that it happens to us. It could happen to somebody we love, or care about, or a coworker. So we've all gone through that what now and moved on. When I do workshops often with people on, on personal change, I sit down and say, start to list all those times when your life was forever changed by some unwanted news. And you know, it's not an exercise most of us want to do, but what I want you to do this for is we have all survived many, many, many have. And we're going to have, my mother's 96, and she keeps showing me, it doesn't stop. You know, even if she has a loving family, but lots of the things, she has to continuously accept the world that's getting smaller and different. So we all know that, that we can survive. And when I've done these workshops and asked people, take 20 minutes, you know, take 15 minutes to start to listen. Well, you come up with 20, sometimes 30. I've had people raise their hands and say, hey, can I have some more? And we also know when these kinds of things happen to us, with the what nows, that it, it, it's, it takes a lot to make life work again. When it comes together, it falls apart. It comes together, it falls apart repeatedly. And all of us have to figure out how to move forward. Well, you know, with this, I became a widow 11 months later, not two months later. So we did stretch out by doing some unusual things and different things. It turned out that I'm a hell of a research when I'm motivated. And we found all sorts of unusual ways and things to do. Because often the medical community doesn't have your answers. And, and each of us has our own way of healing. What we learned is we could not cure the cancer that we could heal. <coughs> a lot, the family and ourselves and our relationships among us and each other. Well, as an expert on change, I'm constantly helping organizations with their what-nows. 
I'm constantly helping them figure out what's the next product and how to get customers to come and how to work with the other end groups. I'm constantly, I'm supposed to be the expert on change. So when I lost my husband, I knew some of the stages I would go through. You know, we, we, the same kind of things, whether it's being back or whether it's relationships or it's a setback or different things. There are stages we go through. The stages of disbelief and anger, you know, the stages that say, let's get on with life, and the stages that, that come. And they don't come nice and linearly, do they? Sometimes you can be really angry and let's get on with life. You know, they're not separate and they're not, you're done with stage one, now stage two comes. They get all of this because sometimes you think, okay, I'm too high. And guess what? <laughs> you know, right? You got some heads nodding, right, around the room? We know that that's not true. What got to me was, is I was doing my best to do what all the experts say to do. And I'm an overachiever, so I don't just do it. I really do it. And I first of all, I'm taking care of the whole family, making sure all my kids are doing well, making sure the relatives are. When I'm going to social events, people don't know what to say when they come up to me. Do you ever get that? So I'm trying to put them at ease, saying, oh, it's so good to see you. How are you this evening? And I'm trying to show them how to approach me. I'm taking care of everybody else. Now, three things that they always tell you to do in any seminar you go to. Make sure you're eating well, sleeping, and getting plenty of exercise. Well, folks, overachiever, right? <laughs> you know that this is going to be good. I am bicycling, not motor. I am bicycling 120 miles deep on the WOD trail, if you know where that is. <laughs> you are. I got another bicycle out here. I am doing three Pilates classes a week. Because we all know the caregivers, our health goes down, and I'm trying to build myself back up again. Whole Foods calls me for advice on food. <laughs> I got so holistic and you know, making sure that when my husband was sick, that we were making sure that we didn't have plastics and we didn't have all the things that are not maybe toxic to a healthy person. But to a non-healthy person, they are. And for the first time in my life, man, I am going to bed and I'm not setting any alarm clock. You know, I'm getting 10 12 hours of sleep. Man, I should be on top of the world, right? No. Well, why is it then that every time I went to a social event, you know, people are afraid to come up to me and you know, I'm doing my best to put them at ease, showing them that I'm really not contagious, I don't have the measles, they're not going to get sick. I am still Linda. And are they going to say something wrong? You bet, right? You know, because all of us want something different. Some of us want somebody to talk to us. Some people don't want us. We, we have all have different needs, and it could be different days in the week I have a different need. You know, one day, you know, don't ask me how I am, please. That always starts me to cry. But, but anything else. I would go to social events, and at least five to eight times throughout that evening, guess what question, what, at the very end of the conversation, people always want to give advice. You ever notice that? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to give advice. And they would say, Linda, make sure you're eating, sleeping, and exercising. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, shucks. Now, it doesn't look like I need that advice, folks. I mean, I don't look that different other than a few more wrinkles than at the time. But I would always say, what you do when somebody gives you a birthday gift and you, already, and you don't need it, you already have it? You turn to them and say, thank you. And I just learned, rather than say what I really wanted to say is, <laughs> look at me, folks. That doesn't help. I mean, I wish it did. It's not working. I would just say, thank you. Oh, that only works so long, doesn't it? Or you put yourself last. And you let everybody else be first. Now, I'm going to stop the story there, and I'm going to take you on the story. I'm going to come back to this. So hold on, okay? Gotcha. As an expert on managing change, I said to myself, this is really embarrassing, Linda. 18 months after your husband has died, you are still grieving. I mean, you're all, I mean, please, you're all going, yeah, so why? <laughs> 18 months, that's nothing. But to me, I thought, I should at least, you know, I'm gonna love him. I'm gonna hold him in my heart. I still do. I understand the way we come back on every, you know, 
Every so often they come back on. In fact, I made them bigger so I could wear them on my right hand. You know, I, I wear my wedding band on my middle finger and my diamond on the other one, so be a little cuter. But, but anyway, I said, what would you say to a client who's stuck? And Einstein has a quote that most of us know, and it's saying, do more, doing more of the same and expecting different results is what? Insanity. Insanity. Okay, so, what are you doing to you imagine around you? Everybody, you have a big bubble. And it's full of words and ideas about who you are. I don't like mornings. I don't like the cold. I like people that are forthright. I like this. I don't like that. You know, I'm a mother. I'm a, you know, I'm a... A wife, I mean, we fill this bubble up with who we are, right? We have beliefs that we have, things that we have, and what we're doing. And this bubble starts to make who we are. Well, when I come into companies, companies also have a bubble around them. It says, here's the way we treat clients, here's what we do. And one of the things we have to do when we're not moving forward, when doing more of the same is taking them down the hill, we have to fill that up, this bubble of who you are. I was asked once by an insurance company to take all of the people in two divisions off-site and to do a team-building exercise. The president of the organization had decided that marketing and the operations, which always fought with each other, because marketing over promises and operations says, we've got to now build this, we can't do it, and it's the issue. He decided he was tired of the victory. So he decided, let's put both of these divisions together. <laughs> so you take two groups of people that don't like each other, and you say, now you're one happy family. And Linda, you take them off site, because you're so good at team building, and you bring them into a team. <clears throat> oh my god. Oh, he did one more great thing, too. He also said, the two heads of those departments will co-lead together. So did put one person in charge. He was going to put them both in charge. I went and said, if we try to do a kumbaya, please, that's not insulting to anybody. I believe deeply in the words come by here. But if I try to do a kumbaya kind of, of team building exercise, would it work with this group, folks? Can you take two groups together that don't want to say, how do we go play nice and work in the sandbox together? I knew better. What I did is I had then come into, 15 people come into the big ballroom that we were supposed to be meeting in. And I didn't even have chairs for them to sit down on. I just had a big flip chart. And I said to them, I want you to number off by fours. Yeah. Now, I was going to make sure that I had enough people from both sides. It was very easy. All the one group was together, all the other was together. <laughs> we numbered off. And I said, your assignment is to go to the four corners of the room where I had flip chart papers. Have somebody be your recorder. <coughs> And I want you to fill up as many pages as you can of ways to make this business fail. Now, they wouldn't have worked on how to make this business work, but one thing they shared in common was what? They wanted to see it fail. So they went to those four corners of the room, and they worked enthusiastically together on how to make this business fail. About 25 minutes later, I called them back into the center room and I said, now I'm going to give one group marketing yellow dots, you know, those peel off little Avery dots that you have, and I'm going to do the other one blue dots. And I'm going to give you a break. But before you can take a break, take as many dots as you want, go around and read all the ideas on the flip charts. And anything we're already doing, put a dot in front of the number. And then take the team a break. They did that. We came back in, we went to the first one. Almost every idea had what? <laughs> 15 to 18. We went around the room. I brought them all back into the center of the room and I said, now what? What do we do? This time there were chairs in a circle. And they said, we don't need competition, do we? We're not going to be around, is what they said, if we don't change. They had to blow up the box of the old belief systems before they could move into something, something different. Okay, back to my story. <laughs> <clears throat> Finally, after 18 months, I go and I 
say to somebody, my brother and sister-in-law call me, my sister and brother-in-law call me every Sunday night on the phone just to make sure I'm okay. They live in California. And I answered the phone and I said, how are you? And they said, we've talked, and at the very end of the phone call, my poor brother-in-law, this is back when we still had, um, what do you call it, um, same phone lines, but it What? Yeah, extension, thank you. So old in my memory, I can't remember. I do know what a party line is, though. Anyway. They were both on the, the line together, and I, when my brother-in-law says, Linda, make sure you're eating, sleep, and exercise. I, I lost it. Oh my God, when you're so good for so long, and you hold it all in, when it comes out, oh my gosh, I'm not young. At one point in my career, I worked in South Philadelphia with black teenage gangs. I have a rich vocabulary that I normally <laughs> don't use, but somehow it surfaced. My poor brother-in-law heard exactly what I thought of that idea. I said, no one has done this more than me. It doesn't work. Now, another thing I used to do with groups when they got stuck, you can't tell me how to, how to make something better, tell me how to make it worse. You can't tell me how to lose weight, tell me how to gain weight. You can't tell me how to gain customers, tell me how to lose weight. Because if you start with that opposite, what can you do? You can flip it, right? So I thought, if eating, sleeping, exercise doesn't work, I was really pissed. I said, it doesn't work. And in fact, I'm going to, and I thought, what is the most unlikely thing I can think of? I said, I'm going to go and buy a jumbo bag of potato chips and eat that sucker straight down through because I'm from southeastern Pennsylvania where we fry it in lard and they have little pockets in it with lots of salt on it. And I have not had any for three years. And I'm going to, and I thought, what else is so unlike myself? And I said, and I'm going to learn to ride a motorcycle. I thought motorcycles were noisy, they were dangerous. It's the last thing I would ever want to do. Oh man, it felt so good to be rebellious. It felt so good not to be the nice girl anymore. It felt so good not taking care of anybody else. And I hung up the phone. And for another three minutes, I was going, yes. And then I went, oh, no. <laughs> I can see my sister calling my mother, who's calling my sister. And they're going to, they're going to do a helpline. There's going to be a bus driving up in front of my house, a little white, you know, put a little sleep in the jacket. This is going to be like, and they caught it in the quandary. But remember what I did in the corporate world? Remember what I said about Einstein? I have inside of my bubble tried everything I know to make life come back together. And life is functioning. I don't mean that. I'm able to get out of bed. I'm able to eat. I'm able to socialize. People think I'm the model widow when they see me in public. They don't see me when they're not in public. I can't find that thing that just makes me excited about life. It's routine. It's you know, happening repetitively. I can't find that which makes me want to get up. It's like today is another day. I'm going up. Yeah, today is another day. And then I said to myself, when are you finally going to break this bubble that you're in? When are you going to blow up this box or this bottle and do something completely outside of what you know? You can't do anything more than you know. Now, I started knitting. I knitted at least 50 scarves. If you knew me at that time, you got to start. My daughters, my daughters live in Texas and in Florida and in California. So if you said hi to me, I'm sorry, sir. You got to start. You got to start. You got to start. I hope you like the colors. It was therapy for me. The colors of knitting, they gave me something to do when you're not doing anything. You know, I, I did try to go out and take ballroom dancing classes. And ballroom dancing classes, because I said, what can you do now? You couldn't do it. It was fun when I danced. It just seems like what dancing came home. So, I was having lunch with a good friend. And he said to me, Linda, are you good? Good, good. You sound good. And then he pointed to his heart. What are you doing here? I said, Ron, it's so bad. It is so bad. I've threatened to ride a motorcycle. <laughs> now, 
I'm such a tree hugger and a greenie. I expected some of the sympathy from him, and he starts to laugh. And that's not what I'm expecting. I'm not expecting laughter. I'm expecting a little bit of empathy. We've been friends for 30 years. We've been through all sorts of crap. And, you know, watch each other's kids grow up and go off to college and all sorts of stuff. And he's laughing at me. And he says, Linda, don't you know I organize motorcycle trips for troops all over the world? <laughs> I said, you're a half angel? <laughs> And he says, no, no, we're doctors, we're lawyers, we're business people. And in two months, we're flying to Vancouver, Canada, and we're going to do, we're going to rent Harleys when we get there. Rent them, not buy them, rent them. And we're going to do the coast of Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. And for a tree hugger, you know what he said? Redwoods. Oh, I don't know how many of you have ever seen Redwoods, but it's really common. When you're standing in front of a tree that you can't possibly draw on some and he says, normally there's six to eight of us, but this time there's only four of us. And the woman that was going with her husband, the husband is starting a new business, and he doesn't think he can take two weeks off. And he won't let her go unless we have another woman on the trip. You're it. <laughs> and I said, no, absolutely no, that's not who I am. I'm not a biker. No, I don't know how to ride. I don't want to learn how to. You know, I already had a mother who's lost a son. I mean, you know, my kids have lost a father. You know, I can't do something that's so dangerous. No, 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 no way. And as lunch was over, he said to me, think about it. Just promise not think about it. And I'm like, okay, but no way. He sent me pictures of redwood trees. <laughs> <laughs> the Oregon coast by email. I got my morning wake up temptation. And I was sort of like, no, 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 no. And then I finally had a real talk with myself. I said, what are you going to do to change the pattern? What are you going to do to get out of this cycle you're in? How do you heal yourself? How do you move forward again? How do you make life work? I said, not doing more of the same. So I went online, and I researched learning life classes. He lives in Maine, and if you know anything about motorcycling, you will know that every learn to ride class that's offered by anybody is over full in Maine. Because all these people want to suddenly go motorcycle riding. And I, 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 I searched all over the internet, and everything says, no, no, full, full, full. And I said, see, God's telling me, don't do this. And I decided to do one more thing, which is just put hardly learn to ride classes for G. And doggone. A site comes up. And I go online and I'm looking at their classes and there's full, 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 and as I'm looking at it, one of the fools changed to open. <laughs> Somebody had just canceled. I signed up. I said, what can it hurt? I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. Oh, it was so much fun telling everybody I was going to learn to ride. Oh my gosh, you know, we are, you know, how pet? Have you ever met a man on the floor for a second? I'm sorry. You know, I was tired of puppy dog eyes and cooing voices being told to walk gently and pamper myself. I wanted the thrill of speed. I wanted the wind biting at my face. I wanted to know I was alive again. What did I feel? Oh, yes. I walked into the Harley dealership the morning of the three-day training class, standing outside and I'm ready to take on the world. I open up the big heavy glass door and I walk inside, looking for the class. And as I walk by the women's clothing section on the left, I'm looking up. And I see a t-shirt up there with a woman on it that would make a Barbie doll blush. <laughs> and I think to myself, oh, and all that 60s and protesting and feminist stuff that I did. I forgot this is part of it. And right behind that was a skull and crossbones all done in rhinestones and glitter. It was, and the last thing I'm ready to do right now is make fun of death. I mean, death is real. Death is not funny. I'm not going to... How could I forget that this isn't the group of people? <laughs> I mean, there's a good reason why I didn't learn to ride a Harley before. <laughs> These are two of them right here. I continued to arm down, looking for what a classroom could possibly be. After all, I told all these people, right? You know? 
and there is a fat boy. It is yellow and orange with flames running from front to back, and it's on a turnstile going around. And as I approach it and look at it, I go, oh my god, these things are huge, you know. I always sort of thought of them as a big bicycle. I got it, and I look at the buttons and leathers, and, and the foot gear, and they're, how am I going to learn to ride this in three days? And I forgot about balancing. The balance, I mean, this is not a bike. This is something, this is a 800 pound, 1,000 pound leg. I gotta learn to balance that. If you drop that, that's too good to fall off your bike. I'm really ready to panic, and I finally found, okay, the classroom's there, and I go there, and I look inside, and there he is, the teacher. He has a ponytail in the back, and he is covered with tattoos up and down, and he's leaning forward and saying, yeah, in the last three words, I've taught tank drivers how to drive. <laughs> oh, shit, that's been my teacher. <laughs> he's not going to be holding my head and saying, poor, poor, you know, don't be brave, you can do this. Nobody in that classroom looked like me. I looked at everybody in the country. I got I dressed down in my Banana Republic t-shirt. <laughs> pressed, pressed jeans and my, my new Nike money shoes. <laughs> I swore I was going to go at lunchtime and leave my Harley shirt if I could have tucked it in. But how do you wash it a hundred times before the other comes in class? <laughs> because you can't wear a Harley shirt that's not been washed a hundred times or you're seen as a movie. I, I was ready to leave. And I'm telling you this, this part of the story because it's very important to hear. The story I was told by a speech coach that I had was, Linda, tell them. You walked into the Harley dealership, and as you're walking in, you walked over to a motorcycle looking at which one you wanted to buy. And the, and the salesperson came over and he says, may I help you, ma'am? And I said, yes, I want to buy a bike. And he says to me, for your husband or for your for, for your father? And I go, nope, for me. And he says, what do you ride? And I say to him, a Schwinn. <laughs> <laughs> I was too proud to back out of the class. I hung in there. I failed the class. You have to read the rest of the book when you get <laughs> I failed the class. I should have passed it. I just tried to overachieve on the test. And, is something nobody else has ever done by trying to do too hard to be so good. And I failed the class. But, and please, that night, God and I had, she said, we had a real good discussion. Because one thing you really believe is when you finally go out and do something for yourself, what happens there? It should go your way, right? It's like buying a lottery ticket. It's my turn, it's my turn, it's my turn. And it's not your turn. You don't win the lottery and don't go on it. You know, it's not fair. God, I finally did something for me. I did something for everybody else for 18 months. I finally did something for me. And you didn't let me succeed. Why? You can hear the second part of that little bit <laughs> Because it is a good reason. And I'm glad I opened up the class. I had to borrow a motorcycle and I had to practice practice and practice the slow ride. Motorcycling is easy when you're going fast. It's when you're going slow in a parking lot and you're hitting bumps and suddenly something pulls out right or left. It's the slow ride is where you're not really stable and where you don't have the ability to balance. Mm -hmm. well. Going fast, do a balance. You don't supply, but you know, you can fight. So we went on a trip a month after I took that class. I did find the pass. I deal with my motorcycle license. I'm on the trip, and I will tell you, it is 10 days that changed. And I'll tell you why it changed. Why it was different than the ballroom dancing class, which I enjoyed. What was different about this trip? First of all, I was scared to death. You know, you get on a motorcycle, you drop in a group of people, and you're heading out into rush hour traffic in Vancouver on the way to, to I don't know what. The city looked like, all I know is about the lines of this, watching the tail lines, watching. I'm still trying to remember first, second, third gear, what gear am I in, what am I doing next? I'm, I'm, my brain is really full. We, we make it to the ferry, we make it to, to Victoria Island, and then the next day, you know, when we finally get to the main line of Washington State, we're at the gas station. And as we go up to the gas station, this is the first time I'm filling up this, this, this motorcycle. 
And as I pulled up to the gas station, I'm taking off my gloves and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a newbie trick. You learn to keep your credit card or your money right here, so you know, it's back in my purse and it's back in your bags back here, so I'm going to have to do that. So when I start to get off the car, I forgot. I can put down my side stand. You know, and so as I'm getting off, it starts to go. Now I got very strong legs because I'm, I'm a bicycler. But you cannot pull a full size bike upright again once it goes over. Rod is standing right in front of me. He's no further away from me than you are. Why could, why didn't I say the words, Rod, help? I didn't say it. Remember that stupid bubble I told you about before? You can go on a road trip, you can leave home, you can do the opposite thing in the world, but you still take this bubble of who you think you are. I'm very proud of myself that I can be self-sufficient. That's good sometimes, right? Sometimes. Why didn't I call in? Because I'm used to doing it myself. So, it crashes, the, turn, the, the left turn signal cracks the brakes, and of course, I'm humiliated. But one thing about riding on a motorcycle, you have a lot of time to talk to yourself. <laughs> so I continue to talk to myself. I started to realize, I have to change some of who I am. If I'm going to be safe on this motorcycle trip, I'm going to have to change some old beliefs. That's why I'm talking about the bubble that we create around ourselves. It says, this is who I am. This is what works for me. This is You have to start erasing some of the tight boundaries you're in. You have to try new things. You've got to get out of that circle that worked. And if you had stayed married and been still married, you would have changed who you were over time, right? We have to constantly look at what's in here and say, does this serve me or doesn't this serve me? Fear is a big thing on motorcycles, and, and, and it's also joy. I learned something about fear that was very, very important. There is a four-mile bridge that goes between Washington and Oregon. I didn't know that. There's a bridge, obviously. It goes over the Columbia River. There's a Pacific Ocean out there. I didn't prepare this trip, remember? I wasn't going to go on this trip. You pull up, and as you start up the bridge, guess what's in my bubble, folks? I don't do heights. Heights are not mine. <laughs> going off this bridge, it's graded. Motorcycles, you're riding on about a big 50% 50 piece or a silver dollar bill on your front back tire. When you're on a graded bridge, you're constantly, your wheels are going like this, so you're constantly you're kind of steering. And we're going up, and there's, out there is the Pacific Ocean, and I'm looking down as we're going up, it's four miles. Four miles, I can't even see the other side, because we're going to arch like this, go down the other side. We're going up so high that the bars and the clouds are underneath us. There are no walls on the side of this thing. This is big, huge cables. The big, huge cables overhead. And I'm looking down there, and the ships are this big. I don't do heights. I don't do heights. I'm on a bridge, stuck with ships that big. Now I have three bad choices I can make. Ever had three bad choices in life? I can. Do a U-turn and get off this thing. Yeah. A fully loaded motorcycle, because we live in El Travel. I have 50 pounds of luggage back here. Trying to do a U-turn with coming traffic and making it, and we have crosswinds. OK, I'm going to call putting the bike down, which is different crashing. But I'm going to you know, try to do this. This is a very hard maneuver. It's a work on a bridge. And if it works with wind, that won't work. I can stop. Okay, it means I don't have to go any further up, but then I'm stuck on what? The bridge. Ha! I can continue. Now this is the strategy I teach you, because it's one I've learned from this experience. I couldn't look the whole distance I had to go. It was too scary. I did two feet by two feet by two feet. That's all I promised myself. Just do two more feet. Just do two more feet. Do two more feet. Meanwhile, the winds are coming in off the Pacific, and you have to lean into the wind, uh, scale right, except when you go around these big, huge girders that are going up to hold up the thing. Then there's no winds, so you have to then quickly. I made it across, obviously, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I made it across. 
But the thing on the other side that nobody talks about, what do they tell you to do to find joy in life? They tell me, be kind to yourself, Linda. I have massages, I have it myself. I don't have about 600 thread sheets before they even talked about 600. Everybody was talking about 300. Now I'm talking about 1,500. <laughs> I did all the pampering. I, I, like, you know, I was kind to of myself. I, I didn't. You know, I resigned from a bunch of things that were too demanding. I pulled back, thinking I would find joy, right? Right? Huh? Guess what happened when we got across that bridge? We pulled into the state park before right here next to the ocean. And the other guys got off the bike. That have been, they've done at least 15 of these or 20 different types of trips like this. And they went, oh my God, wasn't that something? And they're there. But they're excited. They did. Guess what? I was not as happy any time <laughs> since my husband died as I was at that moment. I felt true joy. Why? I did something I thought I could not do. No one tells a widow or widower to go out and do something you think you can't do. They are. Keep plugging it until you make it. But I will tell you, there is real joy when you take this bubble and make it this big now and not this big. And as you keep pushing out the boundaries of that bubble so that you have more to create from. Now there's more possibilities. And yes, there will be those moments where you go, oh no, well maybe. And so it's not wrong to walk away from something. I don't mean that you always have to hang in there. But it's amazing what happens when you do it. I came back from this trip and I really, really felt changed. Because I had had fun. I had played with it. And towards the end of the trip, I was no longer scared of stiff. I actually, you, you made friends fear. Fear becomes my good friend. It's like, oh my god, yeah, that's part of it. But it doesn't dominate anymore. It doesn't take charge of me. It doesn't keep me from doing something. It's just like, yep, it's there again. Okay, you learn to live with it. I came back and I, I, I immediately enrolled in a scuba diving class. <laughs> I learned to swim at the age of three from a fish. And it was fun. Of course, the scuba diving teacher kept saying to me, is this better than motorcycle? I'm like, no, nope, not yet. <laughs> but I went out and I tried to say, what are the things that you could do now? Now that you know, you can face hard times. Back when we were talking before, we've all gone through those hard times other than being a widow or a widow, haven't we? Life is not a gift, but life is bliss. And then suddenly you become a widow or a widow and suddenly it falls apart. We have gone through it. Do you know what? There's a word called resiliency muscle. You know what that is? Your resiliency muscle is what you do to get you through the hard times. You know, when my husband was on this, I'm a researcher. I mean, I hit that thing and said, let me go and Google everything I can. If they say we don't know what to do, let me find out what can be done. I wouldn't talk to everybody I knew. I mean, that's how I handle it. A setback because I research. I mean, fire me on a job they under me that next day online figuring out what other jobs there are to do in the world. If you tell me I can't do something, I research. Other people use humor. They make fun of it. You know, we all have that way of coping. Some people surround them with friends, themselves with friends, and tell their stories and get support that way and say, just give me a hug. Others of us push everybody away and say, I don't want to see anybody out of now. I just want a long time. I want time to be with myself, with who I am. Right? You all have that resilience muscle. Don't forget it. It's there. And the more different kinds of resilience muscles you create, you know, better it is. Now when someone says, tell me you need sleep and exercise, I, I tease them back. And I say, are you doing it? <laughs> <laughs> because the best advice is always advice we give others that we're not following ourselves. <laughs> So I've learned to take on humor. I've learned to take on. Rebellion is one of my characteristics. And don't you think of it? I wrote a, uh, an article about that, and AARP and everybody published it everywhere. They love the idea that rebellion is something that adults do. It is, isn't it? When the rules don't work for us, when we follow the rules, when we've done everything the way we're supposed to do, and it's still not working. 
that's my teenagers who said, your girls don't work anymore. You know, and then we go, oh. but we do that too, don't we? Look at how fast everybody goes on the 495. Why? <laughs> Nobody believes that the rule of 65 makes any sense. We rebel, don't we? We go, to the, I don't believe everybody here, I'm sorry. I'll raise mine. <laughs> I go faster than 65. Unless I see a cop car. And a police car. Yeah. And please, I'm glad the police car is here. But anyway, I'm just saying to you, when more of the same doesn't work. One of the problems I had was, I was so used to, when I work with companies, we say, here's the current state of who you are. Right now, all of us could do that, right? I'm this person, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And over here, we would put another foot chart and we'd say, and this is the future state of where we want to go. And we would put the characteristics, and then the work to be done is, what's the difference between these two? And that becomes the actions. Where I was stuck, and this is where I don't find enough books and things out there for literates and literates. But there's a lot of material on greeting you know, what to do, and how to do it, and how to get through it, and we all know that we are each a story of one, right? We can't walk somebody else's path. I'm gonna give you eight steps, and some of those steps make sense, and others don't, but we all know that there's lots of support for grieving. But when you're ready to eventually start to say, who am I now? That I, I recognize I am single. And please, I say I'm single, but there's part of me that's always going to be married. I'm a single. And I loved that future. My problem was I couldn't identify it. I couldn't say what, I could see, you know, different smell circles, the possibilities of what I could do. But I couldn't find any bearing ones. And that's a hard one, because if you don't know where you want to go, because I didn't want to say what I do. If you don't know where you want to go, it's very hard. Take something <coughs> that you're trying to think of that I say, I know I need to do something, okay? Got something? I know I need to do something. Got it? Okay, this is a game show. Uh -huh. I may have three curtains, A, B, and C. And that first one is you open it up, and it could be a car, it could be nothing. We open it up and we see a solid cement block wall. Is that good or bad? If that was your idea of what you thought it might be? What solution to your idea was that? Is it good or is it bad? <laughs> Well, it's good because now I know, don't, don't, don't. I'm going to try this one. And it turns out to be wonderful. Is that good or is it bad? It depends. In this one, I'm going to make it, we open it up and we see 15 more curtains behind it. That's often the way it is when we go out. So, we all share a common occurrence of loss, whether it's ourselves having lost a partner or someone else we care about. It is hard to move forward. I'm not trying to say that the techniques I was telling you about, chunking it down, doing the two feet, spanning the other thing, opening up new curtains, is the answer for everybody all the time. But I want you to know that to make life work again, you gotta go out and explore. And it can be baby steps, but little pieces.